Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 13, Regenerative Agriculture, featuring Melissa Hoffman. Melissa Hoffman is a co-owner of Show Farm in Vermont. Show Farm is a unique place where organic farming, agroforestry, plant medicine, rewilding, and a duck sanctuary all mix in what Melissa calls a living laboratory. On May 23, 2020, Melissa and I talked shop about the various experiments they are trying out on their 1,300-acre parcel, including veganic methodology, integrating wildlife, utilizing so-called invasive plants, relocalizing our diets, encouraging pollinator habitat, indigenous land management practices, the need for adaptability in both practical approach and in mind, and many other topics. Last year, Show Farm entered the CBD market and is applying their special ecological approaches to this crop as well. This episode will be of special interest to farmers and gardeners, but should be eye-opening for anyone else who is curious about true sustainability. Well, thanks for taking some time out of your busy farm schedule to talk with me today, Melissa. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Calibri. I'm I'm pleased to be here. So how about we start off with, uh, you can let us know a little bit about what it is that you do there at Show Farm in Vermont. Sure. So um, I live in the mountain region of northwestern Vermont, just outside of Burlington, just east of Burlington, along the spine of the Green Mountains. And we live on uh, 1,300 acres here, which is an an, um, unusually large piece of land. And the purpose of acquiring it was sort of in two pieces was to actually conserve and protect a large wild landscape, uh, protect it from development and use it as an experiment for um, a combination of renewable energy, wildlands protection, green building and uh, perennial food systems. So I moved here uh, to this particular property in 2003, and uh, so I've been here for a good 17 years, and it's been, I think, the longest I've uh, remained on any one piece of land and had the privilege and opportunity to observe so much over time and learn from place, which has been uh, an invaluable experience. So uh, the reason... uh, I run a nonprofit foundation called Living Future Foundation. And the the foundation acquired this property in order to demonstrate uh, an integrated approach to a a living and a future-oriented regenerative human infrastructure. Uh, So that's why we originally focused on buildings plus energy plus food and showed how they could all be one part of a system, but also all of them would be in relationship to the wildlands, the occupants of the woods, the fields, the soil, the water. Um, So everything would be very conscious in its design in relationship to all these different contexts. So uh, that was its original intent and to and then to host conversations of different groups different people who are focusing on these issues of human relationship to ecosystem to wildland to place on a global scale and have this place host those conversations as it is trying to innovate and trying to examine the relationship the proper relationship to all of this and learn so that as we all know, um, 
those of us who've been to conferences, oftentimes those conferences are held in very sterile environments that don't reflect the very values that the, that the conference might be trying to uh, propagate. So we thought of, of this as a, not a conference center, but as a living laboratory that could attract um, people who are doing this work um, from many different fields, nonprofits, uh, people doing uh, ecological innovation research in, in renewable energy systems, food systems innovators, culinary innovators. Um, so that was the sort of the original impulse behind it. Right. And so, there's a duck sanctuary there, too. Yes, this was a more recent addition. Uh, we, I was married in 2010, and my wife um, and I were purchasing rice from a, a local rice grower who was demonstrating this integrated duck rice um, agriculture. And so we thought, great, local organic rice, let's support this initiative. And we went to the farm and he very graciously showed us around. We saw the ducks swimming around in the rice paddy. And just, you know, it's a, it's a very bucolic and very attractive idea. And then later we, we sort of, we, we sort of, we learned uh, that, that the ducks were, you know, purchased in, you know, this particular year, 400 at a time. Now it's something like 800 um, from a, a, a hatchery. And then they are maybe in the, in the young rice paddy up until a point where the rice grows to a certain height. And then they're removed and then sent to slaughter or, uh, or sold for uh, egg laying. And we learned of their fate. And um, along the way, of course, they're, they're very vulnerable to wild predators like snapping turtles and weasels and raptors like owls and hawks. Um, so we decided to adopt the flock. That year's flock, there was 116 that this farmer was wanting to sell. And we thought, well, why not take these animals who are slated? You know, he wanted to sell them all in, at once instead of multiple transactions for administrative, to save administrative time. And he did mention that they might be going to a, a dog food factory, and we felt crushed with that idea. So we thought, well, let's let's adopt them and integrate them into our agroforestry or permaculture system as partners and as you know a living element of, of of the system. And so that was where the idea was born to look at how these animals, which were raised, they're khaki Campbell ducks, they're they're bred ducks. They're bred for egg laying and they're bred for meat production. They're bred for a specific human food source. But what happens when we give them a lifetime uh, habitat in our in sanctuary and in relationship to um, the orchard where there's obviously a lot of bugs, a lot of opportunities for foraging, and to establish a, a, a relationship with them over time? And... So that became, that is now an element of what we're doing. I would say the two primary elements of what we're doing here is growing plant foods, both wild, um, wild tended and cultivated in relationship to previously farmed animals, i.e. the ducks, and in relationship to wildlife. So we're looking at these um, um trying to, to really create a lot of space for understanding what the right relationship to these animals can be in the food system of the future. That sounds really remarkable. I haven't, I've certainly heard of people rescuing animals, but I haven't heard of people then uh, integrating them into their operations. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's interesting to note that there are there are many people who want to give sanctuary to animals, and it's it's out of a very uh, respectful and loving response. And oftentimes, uh, and most most of the time, it's an intervention in an industrial food system. And basically, what most people the the, the animals that most people are adopting or giving refuge to, um, if they're not wildlife rehabilitators, 
are the refugees from a very broken agricultural system. Um, so what, there are a lot of issues involved in that. And so some places are, are dedicated to saving the animal from slaughter or impending slaughter. And, and then a lot of places are, um, uh, keeping them in, in very lovely, well-tended conditions, but not necessarily in relationship to an ecosystem. So that, for example, so many different animals benefit from the shade of uh, like a conifer tree. And you can, like when you have birds, like chickens or ducks, they seek protection from, over, from aerial predators. So it's nice to have some kind of canopy available to them in a natural canopy. And so, uh, but a lot of sanctuaries might might be more sterile and more, more focused on animals and they're they're not really exiting from a more industrial model of how to keep animals they import their food they import their bedding they export the the nutrition or the waste that comes from the manures that come from the animals and it's not really being done in relationship to an ecosystem so um both Sean and I are are, are vegan in, in our approach to looking at how to establish a non-exploitative relationship to animals, uh, but also to ecosystems and also looking at all of the ripple effects of our consumer choices and, and, and the way we interact with a living planet, which I think is, is an ultimate direction and, a not, and, and people in a vegan community are, are aware to differing degrees of how something is grown, for example, how their sustenance, where, where it comes from, what's the context. And in speaking about animals and sanctuary, rescued animals could, it, the way we keep them could have such a larger impact if we were to um, re, re, re-relate them like some sanctuaries do. There's a great sanctuary called the Pig Preserve that takes only pigs, I think it's in Tennessee, and they observe the animals because they're very social and they form their own social groups and they locate themselves at a specific spot on the, on the farm. And then they go build their, their shelter and their structure where the pigs select to locate themselves. So they follow the impulses and the, and the uh, instincts of the animal and they relate to that animal as a self directing um, being, which is fascinating to me. It's fascinating and then you can design, um, of course, there are, there, there are possible relationships between farmers and growing food and sanctuary animals that I think the, the veganic world and that sort of held its, that, that holds uh, a lot of its origin and history in the UK, like with Ian Tolhurst's work, the veganic uh, growing Ideals and definitions exclude and preclude animal products in all forms, including animal manures, which would come from sanctuaries in this case and in our case. And so we're sort of playing a little bit of a um, we're, we're skirting the official and more institutionalized definition of veganic by deliberately incorporating the we compost the the. the the spent duck hay that has their manure in it. We compost it and we reintegrate it into the um, agroforestry and food system. So some would argue that that's not really veganic and some would. So I just wanted to, you know, clarify that not everyone agrees that this is wholly a veganic approach, but that's what, that's, it's what we're practicing is changing the relationship between um, uh, uh, humans and animals in a very intentional way. Right. And yeah, that definitely sounds like you're very cutting edge there. And I want to talk uh, definitely about a lot of the specific things that you're doing. But first, maybe we could spend just a few minutes talking about how it is that agriculture in general, even organic farming, is harmful to wildlife. Because I think that while the vegan diet is not cruelty free, it is less cruel, I think is a better way of putting it. And I think that a lot of people are unaware of how just the general practices of farming end up harming a lot of wildlife. That's a great question. And 
I think as a disclaimer and part of the answer is that humans, we, we always have impact and it's unavoidable in meeting our needs and everything we do has impact. Whether we walk across the grass, we could be crushing a, a worm or a, a little peeper toad or, you know, anything we do is going to have an effect on others. So it's a, it's a question of how to be, be as deliberate as we can be. Um, and there's no, um, we can't live in denial that our actions have uh, effects on others and will take the lives of others, whether intentional or not. Um, it's an unavoidable fact. So I guess the, I would say that um, when agriculture can, can exist in so many forms and we require at this point, annual vegetables to feed um, annual grains, annual vegetables, annual staples, in addition to perennial staples. And there's clearly an opportunity to increasingly perennialize our, our food choices to, and a lot of research being done to show practically how to do that. And it's far more practical to do that in a more tropical climate uh, than it is in a cold temperate climate like where I live in Vermont. Um, but the impact is multifold. Uh, it, it it's not only in um, mechanizing a highly mechanized uh, model of agriculture, which designs a cropping system around what a, a piece of machinery can do and can do very efficiently. And some say cheaply, but others would argue it's it's a false economy because you're 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 you're, you're purchasing equipment on a debt model. You're loading it up with fossil fuels to run it. You're requiring the the homogenization of a landscape in order to make that equipment work properly. You're mowing down hedgerows, for example, in, in the British countryside in order to accommodate larger equipment and achieve quote unquote higher yields from what you're growing. So you're, there's, there's a cost to it that doesn't get factored into the, um, the market cost that you, you might see it at, 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 at the price at the point of purchase. Um, but there's an incursion into wildlands. There's a, a, an incursion into ecosystems in order to grow many of our crops. But I would also add to that graze, um, and and the homogenization of a landscape, whether it's for the purposes of grazing animals or growing field crops, um, has an enormous impact on on wildlife wildlife habitat, um, the capacity for the soil to absorb large rainfall events and even larger rainfall events now. Um, it's, as you know, there are multiple habitat impacts of, uh, of both grazing and tillage agriculture. So, however, um, what we're losing, I, mean, I think, any kind of human development that fragments the landscape is impacting the resilience of, of wildlands, the capacity for all of those um, intricate and mysterious to most people and um, vibrant uh, life-giving processes that involve so many different lives whether it's a predator or prey species or um, microbial life or, uh, you know, the, the system of mycorrhizal fungi in a forest that sequester so much carbon as we're, as we're learning, uh, disrupting that with human fragmentation and habitat fragmentation has enormous consequences for us. And we're seeing now in biodiversity loss and loss of um resilience in the landscape and in the ecosystem and the incursion of and the cross the the, the unintended consequence of um wild uh, of otherwise benign pathogens into the the human um community in a very devastating manner as we're seeing now and we have seen in the past so um the consequences of agriculture are multifold to habitats, to human health, 
to other species, to the, the vibrant network of life that, that keeps us going, and even to um, carbon sequestration and, and, and climate. So there's just infinite subtlety in that. It's a very gross way of describing what's actually happening, but it's undeniable. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons why we keep it going is because we can't feed as many people that are that are on the planet if we don't. <laughs> you know, if we just wild tended, we we wild tending would not necessarily support the kind of population we currently have on this planet in agriculture, in a way artificially stimulated um, our 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 numbers as a human species. Yeah, historically, the human population indeed began to rise with the institution of agriculture in the, in the mid in the Middle East. You know, ten thousand years ago. That that's certainly that's certainly true. That is when it started to to go up. Now, where you are, you know, you said you had thirteen hundred acres, and that's that's a, a big, you know, that's a big farm for your part of the country. But then you look at say, you know, the U.S. Midwest or California Central Valley, or even Oregon's Willamette Valley, where I was farming, and 13 acres, 1,300 acres would be very small. You know, these places are all, they're huge, you know? And in all cases, what they are is they are former wildlife habitat of some kind. Either they were prairie, right. you know, or they were wetlands, or they were forests, or they were uh, oak savanna, you know, which is like a mix of grasslands and trees like that's what a lot of the Willamette Valley was 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 oak savanna and then wetlands and you know uh, something like 90 percent of the wetlands in the United States have been impacted for quote development and a lot of that is agriculture and then right. of everything that's agriculture uh, the amount that's being grown that's dedicated to growing food directly for people is something like one-fifth only like it's like less than a quarter of all of that is actually being used to grow food directly for people. So a large chunk of the of the um, corn in the Midwest is being used to grow. Um, it's being used for quote biofuels. You know, so that right. was a lot of land was taken out that that was um, had been fallow and was serving wild creatures was was taken out of that and put in you know for that crop you know, but. All this is just to say is that um, that's the the sort of rule of agriculture is that it's large, is that it's monocropped, is that there's machines that are running over it, and that everything is excluded except the crop. And so this is how most grains are grown. This is how most vegetables are grown. And organic farmers are allowed to kill as many animals on their land as they want. There are some sprays they're not allowed to use, but they're allowed to shoot gophers or, you know, anything like that. Exactly. That was a great summary of the issues. And one of the conundrums that we're, we're trying to grapple with now, as are a lot of us um, here, is what does it look like to restore wild habitat and in part meet human needs and then shrink our sh shrink our agri if, if we can how do we shrink our agricultural footprint so that i don't think we're going to get be, be getting rid of agriculture but i think we can harmonize it as best as we can to then um say for example and this is this is an example that we're trying to do our research paper about and get sponsorship for doing research where if you look at a simple 10 acre plot on two different land masses um, one is rotationally grazed so that um, uh, even our neighbor our neighbor has almost the same we have a lower field here it's on a riparian corridor and our neighbor keeps maybe 15 sheep um, on a similar um, size land mass but rotationally grazes it. So um, there's always grass. Uh, nothing ever comes necessarily to bloom or, or blossom for uh, pollinator food or habitat or even uh, grassland bird habitat. Um, versus, say, take 
the same 10 acres and grow intensive and conservation, soil conservation minded, the best practices you can do, like organic no-till, um, raised permanent raised bed or some such on an acre, and then the rest grow um, agroforestry crops, whether they're acorns, mix of wild and cultivated, or mulberries, or pine nuts, or hazelnuts, or apples, and then keep in between those tree strips, keep pollinator habitat that only gets mowed every three or four years. So it can it can be stable pollinator and grassland bird habitat. And then chart how many calories, how, how many nutrients, how many how much life systems, life force comes off that land um, versus the calories and the net yield um, that comes from a grazed a similarly sized grazed piece so that you're shrinking down essentially the intensive footprint, your impact on, and you're only impacting say one acre or even a half an acre. And then you're letting the other in effect partially rewild while yielding a perennial staple harvest um, on a annual basis. And some, some years it might, you know, as we know, mast, Mast yields are every two years or sometimes even longer um, so that there's a pulses of what's available in the landscape and then adapt our, our food choices to what the land can resiliently supply at the same time as it's supplying habitat for wildlife. And, and look at that as the directive rather than, well, I want this, so I'm going to do this to the land to get that, for, you know, and say, well, how can I, how can we meet our needs and and allow this whole uh, ecosystem to meet its needs and the the residents of the ecosystem to meet their needs in partnership or in in parallel or um, syner- in syner- synergy I really appreciate what you said about adapting our needs to what the landscape is able to do. This is something that's generally ignored you know people even who are just gardeners try to garden all the same things wherever they live across the United States just because those are the things you try to garden regardless of whether or not that thing's actually going to do well in the place that you live and also regardless of whether or not that's a particularly healthy food to eat in the place that you are. Because I would say that in addition to locally grown food obviously having a lower pollution food, you know, a footprint and being fresher and tasting better is also going to be better suited to the health needs that we will have in that area as well. Exactly. In ways that we don't, we're not even aware of because we've lost so much um, of our, our sensitivity to the, to the, the health benefits of, of what even small amounts in season of these wild foods, what they pr- can provide us. Um, you know, as we have Japanese knotweed coming up, which is an invasive, it's not a, a native species, but we have a booming tick population and an increase of, increased incidence of Lyme disease. But here we have this plant that is one of the best protectives and curatives um, in, in synergy with other uh, substances, be they antibiotics or other herbs, to deal with it. And so it's it's an abundance that's right in our faces, and most of us aren't even appreciative or aware of what's growing around us and how whole we can be in re- if, if we learn to relate to our immediate biosphere, our immediate biome more intelligently and share that wisdom with each other and have that be what binds us in community um, is, is, is the rewilding of our understanding first and our food and medicine system in a way that enriches us in more ways than just what we consume. In a state of shock after the war... We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon 
Just go to patreon.com slash Calibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... One of the things you mentioned on your website that you, you make compost teas and you're using some of the, quote, invasive plants for that. Japanese knotweed, bindweed, uh, many people would consider comfrey to be invasive. And then you said horsetail, which is, I believe is a, is a native. Exactly. Um, it, it stands to reason, and I'm not going to claim expertise in this field, but um, I studied I studied permaculture, for example, with Jeff Lawton, and one of the um, points that he raised in our class that I've heard him raise several times is that there are a lot of minerals that are or or elements that are locked in uh, the soil ecosystem that are not bioavailable to plants because it's not a necessarily in a particular pH range. So, say an acid soil, for example. There might not be bioavailable zinc, but a plant like goldenrod will bioaccumulate zinc. It will die, die back, and that and the material of that uh, of that plant of the goldenrod will return to the soil and supply it with zinc. So it's sort of like the um, the soil ecosystem is incredibly diverse. It's not homogeneous, but whatever the land is producing in extreme abundance to me says there's a, there's a nutrient there and a, a trace trace minerals and elements that if we uh, tincture not tincture but brew as in a sense like a tea and reapply it that can make bioavailable in addition to you know excel, accelerating those nutrients and a bioavailability a bioavailability bioavailability to the plants that one is trying to grow. So we do that in part because if you there's it's really hard to get rid of Japanese knotweed once you've cut it and unless you really like um, ferment the heck out of it to to the point where it's anaerobic and it can't grow, it's it, it can re-sprout from the tiniest piece. So that's one way we're looking at trying to reintroduce its nutrition back into the growing system. They so just pack a large garbage can with the biomass, fill it with water, cover it, and um, let it brew for a long time. And then take little bits of it out, make it aerobic with like a compost tea, and then spray it around. This is fascinating to me because every plant that we're going to see in an ecosystem, of course, is there for a reason or to put another way, every plant in the ecosystem is telling us something about the ecosystem by its presence there. And so here you're saying that, you know, particular plants are, are thriving because of what there is in the, in the soil. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a trust exactly of, of what you just described. There's an intelligence and a reason. We may not understand it fully, but it's sort of a, a humility in relationship to what's this particular disturbance or this particular plant or this, why is this plant here? What's it trying to remedy or what's it in response to in its own environment? And how can I um, uh, listen and and make even a an unscientific attempt to um, try things out. <laughs> and, and a, a lot of this is, um, I'm sure there's there, the, I have a, a great respect for the scientific method. Um, but there's also, a, a kind of, um, looking at what's present and what's being communicated by, um, an ecosystem or a landscape. And as you said, there's a reason these plants are here it's in response to a whole series of relationships that we don't even see. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, uh, I can't claim mastery in knowledge in that regard, but, um, th there's something to trying to work with that process of making available what this plant is trying to provide. Right. And, and the area that you're in, 
is you use the word disturbance several times in the area that you're in. New England has undergone a series of disturbances over the last 400 years. You know, the forest is a different forest than when Europeans arrived. The, the mix of plants is different than before the Europeans arrived. And so all of that has some bearing on what it even means to be wild there. Precisely. And, you know, in, say, in the 1940s, I've seen ortho photographs of Vermont where there's hardly any forest. Everything was logged off, um, except for some areas of the steepest hills. Um, and then sheep were grazed here in, in Vermont. Um, and now we're, we're dealing with we're, we're about 80 percent forested, reforested now, which is pretty fantastic and there are some really nice um aged out huge um kind of mother trees in 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 the forest that are little little tiny pockets of older growth and undisturbed growth and and the and we're working with the state to try to establish future areas that are going to be like that so but you're right everything you know so much of what's here is a regrowth of what was here before um and 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 very in a it there's a wildness but it's also you know it's a highly managed landscape in in, in most areas um, as per regulation in the state of vermont um under the current use law um which is another issue we can talk about another time but um Exactly. What is the like if there is an essential wild, which I don't know if there is, <laughs> but if there is, it's this is what we're seeing is, you know, from the regrowth from the 1940s. One thing that you keep mentioning is pollinators and pollinator habitats. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about uh, how you were working, um, working that into your farming there. Certainly, uh, Vermont has over 500 species of native native bees and native pollinators here, and I I'm a trained beekeeper. Um, I learned beekeeping when I was in high school and early college. Um, even my name, Melissa, means honeybee, mm. um, and I was fascinated. A neighbor of ours um, in Michigan, where I where I lived during the summer, um, kept bees, and so. Um, I became fascinated with it. And now I'm far more intrigued and, uh, again, learning who's here, who, who lives here, who lives where I live, um, far more focused on providing habitat and the proper conditions for the native bees and the native pollinators. And to just have, have um, Again, being here 17 years, which is an enormous privilege, um, and getting to observe the, the the relationship between the, the the flowering plants and the insect life that occupies them, and watching and observing all the diversity of insects that are here, it's it's a it's mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing to see how much life coalesces around flowering plants, be they trees or goldenrod, or aster, or milkweed. And then in the last two years, we've we've left our, what used to be mown every year, we have about um, 80 acres total of open pasture, some of it's hayland, and we've let that all go. And we mow paths only, and then we, we mow chunks of it on a rotation in order to allow the 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 flowering plants that are native and naturally here to thrive, we have seen an, an outrageous explosion of monarchs with the, the amount of milkweed that's, that's growing. And it's almost like they've learned to come here now. Um, and I think this is maybe similar. We're not the only property, but it's, it's surged. I never saw a monarch here uh, except for uh, like maybe three or four years ago. And they just started in, 
cloud. So it's to the point where we can, I can't we can't drive down our driveway, which is a mile long, because they like to sit on the warm gravel. And uh-huh. you see these little triangles because they have their wings folded up, and they're just these sort of like uh, they almost look like a Star Wars kind of um, fighter, uh, you know, mm-hmm. jet or whatever craft. Um, and you, you can't drive down the driveway without going so slow that you allow, you don't want to run over them. Um, so I think that that's part of um, the explosion of life and the, the, the living communities that are in residence. And then, okay, what do they need? What, what are their habitats? What plants do they relate to? And there's a whole intricate set of knowledge in you know, which plants have certain companion um, insects that either reproduce with them or in relationship to them, and then which kind of birds come and eat those insects, like turkey, or thrive on insects, and even hummingbirds. Even hummingbirds eat spiders and other insects um, uh, as a protein source, which most people don't know, and I just learned that this year. So there's a huge relationship between these insect communities and you know, other other um, life forms that we've sort of typically come to identify with, like wild turkeys and hummingbirds, for example. So um, the shift involves letting things go really, really wild. And it's it's a struggle in some ways because it's it goes against our aesthetic, you know, the, the, at least the aesthetic we're trained in which is highly managed, very well groomed, you know, beautifully cut hay fields that come up, you know, a verdant and electric green first thing in the springtime. And, and that's Vermont, you know, there's an idyllic kind of image versus these sort of quote unquote messy looking fields that have some dead um, grasses with their grass seed heads, which birds feed on. Um, there's, that's grain. That's, that's a perennial grain right there. Um, and then up come the, up come the, the milkweed and, and the, the goldenrod, which as you likely know, the goldenrod is, is once, once monarch butterflies have hatched, they need pollen sources and they need food sources and goldenrod as well as swamp milkweed, uh, is, is a huge pollen source and food source for them so that they can store up the energy they need to make the migration. And these pollen sources are necessary for them all along the way. So not only in the locale where they happen to be uh, bred, but also in their migratory pathway, you need these perennial forbs and these pollinator, uh, ho- these host plants to be there. Red clover is another one. Um, that they love to in order to keep them healthy for their trip. So it's a fascinating and never it's 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 a never ending un, uh, schooling or education in in the interrelationship between insects, you know, plants, insects, and then other other life forms. I'm probably going on too much. So I apologize, but. Not at all. I, I think it's wonderful. So, so when you're when you're not mowing the the fields, there's other advantages to that too. It's not just the the flowers that get to bloom and the insects that get to be there, but there's all the animals that live in the fields that are harmed or can be harmed, especially depending on timing of when they're mown. Yeah, grassland bird habitat and. You know, mowing is in a, is an important, for, in Vermont at least, it's an important quote-unquote disturbance because if you don't mow, you'll get early successional growth from things like dog bane and then woody perennials like poplar or birch, willow will come in first and they'll, they'll basically eliminate the grassland bird habitat. And which, you know, you could probably have a conversation about, well, is that, you know, because this is a forested, the, the the original landscape here is forested. Maybe that's we should allow it to revert back to a tree or an agroforestry situation. But um, mowing allows those forbs to keep coming back, so that they don't. It just doesn't become forest again. And I think that's important in a 
in the, in the new kind of uh, agriculture or agroforestry or food system to maintain uh, multiple uh, a diversity of communities and habitats and edge between them. So the forest edge where there's um, new scrubby growth is fantastic habitat for grouse. And so you want to make sure that there's always early successional stuff growing there so they can breed and, and feed. And uh, instead of having a neat line of mown grass right up against mature forest, you want edge habitat. And so how can farming and the, uh, kind of a new definition of what agriculture is, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it, and I guess in terms of food, a food system, and a food system would, would imply the capacity for human communities to gain sustenance in harmony with other communities, insects, birds, and wildlife, soil, biota, amphibians, toads, snakes, which explode when you're not disturbing with a mowing regime. Fawns are often left in tall grass here in Vermont in, in June. And they can be killed or harmed with hay, haying equipment, depending on the season and when um, someone's out there mowing, mowing the grass because they're silent and quite invisible. So what you're describing here of, of encouraging grasslands at the expense of um, encroaching forest is, of course, the whole point behind a lot of the intentional burning the Native Americans were doing on the West Coast, the, the 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 Midwest, and all the way in the East. So I'm not sure if people were burning exactly where you are, but they certainly were to, to quite a distance there. We've, we've heard the stories, I'm sure you've heard, about how when Europeans first came here, the forests were open and clear enough that you could, you know, quote, ride a horse at a gallop through them because they were sort of park-like in their, in their openness. So there it seems like what you're doing is sort of having the mowing stand in for what the fire was doing before. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you. I would agree with you there. Um, it's, it's, there has to be some amount of human intention involved, I think, in a, in, a, in a landscape like Vermont that has now hosted these species and that if we left everything just no intervention, it would all, all go back to forest, most likely. But here we are, we're, we're growing food, and we have these, we have these species here. So um, how to engage with them is the question like and how to how to make our disturbance a net gain rather than a net deficit right you also talked about you've talked about um trees about agroforestry here a couple of times i wanted to get into a few more details uh, about that um, for example, you talked about how in the winter time you're careful about the timing of your pruning because of how wildlife likes to eat from the trees too. Yeah, I, I shared that detail a while back, and Stefan um, from Miracle Farms up in Quebec uh, echoed that that's what they do as well, where wildlife, rabbits and deer love to nibble on the buds and the, and the twigs of fruit trees. So if you're, if you're growing, um, whatever you're growing, peaches, pears, cherry, apple, um, if you lay down that material, it's, it's the most, it's the ramial wood. It's where the bark, you, know, you have a greater proportion of bark to wood and that's where the, all the nutrition is. Mm. And they're stored there. And, where, especially now in Vermont, where we're getting these snow events, and then we're getting thaw events, and then we're getting freeze events, it makes it very difficult for those browsers to access, to, to, to knock through that ice layer that will form on the top of the, the snow to get to any forbs or greens underneath. Um, so... To one strategy is to prune in a timely manner when it's most difficult out there for these 
uh, for these animals. And then um, the other reason for doing that is that we're, you know, oftentimes we're, they moose or deer eat, they'll also deposit manure. And so if you're creative, if you're deliberate about the, the pathways, you know, a deer will walk down a, a mowed path more easily than they'll walk down a, you know, an unmown one if the growth is three feet tall. Um, and so you can actually design a transit, a preferred travel route where you say, okay, I'm going to put at different times of the year browse that you like. Deer love Jerusalem artichokes, hmm. um, which is a flower family plant. And it's a, it's a rich tuber that you can dig. Um, and they'll eat those things, you know, so they never actually flower. They'll just come and eat them. Uh, you can you can design their travel routes, and they're they're so they'll, they'll like salad bar it. They'll they'll say, oh, I'll have a little of Jerusalem artichoke. Oh, I'll have a little bit of these apple buds here. Oh, I'll have a little bit. I don't know if they eat willow or not. Um, or comfrey. They'll eat comfrey during certain times of the year. They love vetch in the late fall when there's nothing else. It's all t- about timing. But you can attract them in um, by understanding what they prefer at, at what time and accept their manure uh, into a system, and which is, you know, as many um, livestock farmers out there will tell you, and even regenerative farmers will tell you that animal manures are essential in their cycling the capacity to provide potassium and phosphorus. Um, mostly, in, phosphorus comes from bones, but Animal manures are essential to capture to in, in order to grow pr- production crops where you're removing biomass from the the planting system, um, and and you need to resupply those nutrients to to continue to have a productive system. Well, how can we study wildlife and their browsing patterns, which goes to your question about pruning in the winter, to uh, meet their needs, but also to gather up their droppings. So if they come over a course of three months in Vermont and they come and nibble and they, they put their droppings, by the time the snow melts and the ground is there to receive those nutrients, there can be a lot of poop that's been accumulated. You know, not as much as a, you know, a plop of uh, a cow patty necessarily, but still that's, that's, that's free in a way. It's meeting their need, and then it's it's capturing deliberately and by design capturing their their manure into the system. So how can we learn about that and do that even more and more increasingly deliberately with multiple species? Um, another example is rock walls. We have put in a bunch of rock walls here, rock gardens, which are which basically become condominiums for all sorts of animals, woodchucks, voles, frogs, snakes. And we have a rock wall where a woodchuck has developed a burrow, rats, and they have pooping areas inside those burrows. They have food food storage areas and they have poop poop areas. And when it rains, it the water filters down and deposits those nutrients at the base of the rock wall. Well, the elderberry plant at the base of the rock wall where the woodchucks were denned up is huge. It was mm-hmm. just incredibly prolific. So there, there's that. Um, and it's probably also concentrating water, although the whole area concentrates water. Um, but it's those kinds of just incredibly esoteric and wayward potential relationships where if there's a rodent having a a burrow, um, those nutrients get deposited and those do go to the root zone of, of that particular, of of whatever's in that area. The rodent vacates and income solitary bees or ground nesting bees to occupy that, that old uh, rodent burrow. So you're getting, you know, there's so much going on. So, you don't want to mow in areas where there are, are nests. So you have swaths where you allow burrowing animals to live and thrive, which they can also damage your tree crops. If you don't wrap screens around the 
base of your trees when they're up, you know, still young, those very d- dwellers in your system can girdle your fruit trees. So you have to then like wrap them in screening. So there's just tons of different little strategies and relationships there that um, I think we have the opportunity to study and leverage. And this crosses the, you know, as I'm sure you've found in your work, it crosses the farming, wild tending, and wildlife ecology, wildlife bio- biology lines, so that you're all working together to understand these intricate relationships and trying to facilitate them in a food system. So um, it's it's um, it's 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 a multiple lifetimes worth of work to try to understand this, so that we can rewild what we have taken away from wild habitat while meeting our needs well while meeting and consciously meeting the lives of the the wild inhabitants of our that that we've essentially you know invaded and i don't mean that in a in a um cynical way about human presence because i think human presence it can be quite um Life enhancing is the the opportunity and the choice is always there. Um, the knowledge needs to be refined and and adopted and 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 the motive needs to be there and the intention needs to be there as well. I think that a lot of what you're what you're you're talking about is well not necessarily all the specific things but the way of looking at things where it's like okay how can all of these things be cooperating together. How can I be cooperating with the animals and vice versa and noticing all these relationships? I believe that this is really more of the default for human living uh, for the majority of our history. I think it's really only been in recent times that we've gotten to be so far away from it. I think that the agricultural revolution, um, you know, when they started planting when we started eating lots of annual grains and, you know, started bringing in irrigation and how that led to things like slavery and property. Well, obviously there was something that happened then that was a step away from where we needed to be or that what's best for us and best for the planet. But then the industrial revolution much more recently definitely took us another step away from that. I mean, the tractor had a huge effect on agriculture and on our relationships to the land because we simply weren't able to disturb that much territory to that degree before. And, you know, it's believed that the tractor is what led directly to the uh, the Dust Bowl. Exactly. The plow in particular, this amazing capacity for um, disruption uh, and I don't know, you know, even having or having the illusion of a surplus that then you have to defend or monetize. You know, you have grain stores, you have um, oil reserves, the, you know, this potential energy that uh, is, is, you know, the perception is that it's there for us to use. But for those of us who have control over it and I I think if you remove that um, that presumption about sort of this never-ending abundance or uh, limitless reserve that we can just do what we wish with, with which we can you know, we can we can do whatever we want. This notion that we can do whatever we want transformed into we now have the capacity and the understanding to interact with our environment in a way that's mutually beneficial. And we want that. We don't just want to greedily uh, uh, collect and um, control resources. And this is a big deal. That's what's going to change food systems they kind of go hand in hand. There's a, a cultural shift and a, a shift of human intention, I think, that needs to take place. It's not going to look anything like what we have now. You know, this notion of farming and, you know, a 
a commodity um, model for for our food system, it's there's going to be there's going to have to be concomitant changes in what people are willing to do to engage with an ecosystem and a food system and the, the relationship between those two things. Um, and I don't think we're anywhere near that. But where it's working, I mean, fascinating that the Land Institute is is turning out a perennial grain called Kernza. I, I know you saw that news, um, the perennialization of agriculture and a, a dramatic shift. I don't even know what it's going to look like, but I know it's going to have to look a lot different than what we've inherited in a commodity as a commodity relationship to our food. Uh, uh, I'd love to talk to someone who knows more about this than me, because I don't see how we can use a market economy model with an ecosystem in relationship to an ecosystem. We can't be extracted anymore. We've seen the danger that that uh, places us in, that we're imperiled as a result of it. Um, so what's that going to look like? Because we all need food to live. Right. I mean, I think that, you know, there's experiments that are going on, like what you're doing there, that are showing us uh, to some degree what the physical logistical details of that will look like, but more the different approach that's going to have to be the different mental approach that'll have to be there. You used the word deliberate and conscious uh, several times. And so this is not currently a very deliberate or conscious culture that we live in. And one does not have to be deliberate or conscious in order to live or hasn't had to be up to this point. But I do think that, you know, things change. And we're in a period right now with this pandemic where everything's been turned upside down, all sorts of assumptions about what has to be, you know, and what can't be are are up for negotiation at this point. And so this is one of those places where where there's a possibility now to, to, to turn things. And uh, some people will not go willingly with that. And and circumstances are just going to circumstances are going to dictate a, a lot of it. And within the context of the of the human race as a whole, I personally think that probably the hope for the human race comes not from the United States at all, but from other places that are not empires in decline, that are not settler colonial experiments that don't that aren't conscious of it, you know, aren't conscious of their oppression. You know, I think I think it'll probably come from somewhere else and that there'll just be a, a handful of us here probably trying to do things right personally. And I, I'm not trying to be cynical in saying that. I just feel like this is maybe what's going on. It's kind of the opposite of dogmatism, uh, adaptability, and the capacity to say, okay, to accept the feedback from your environment, whether it's your, you know, whoever you're relating to or your the ecosystem that you're embedded in and say, okay, how can we adapt? How can we move? How can we keep, you know, take this, this new information, absorb it and move forward? Um, is it's a, it's a very, uh, gratifying way of approaching life. And there's a lot less stress in it because if you're, if, if your capacity is adaptability and you have confidence in that ability, it, it's so much less stressful because you accept the fact of changing, ever changing um, stimuli or an ever changing environment, new challenges, and you're not afraid of them. Your first, your, your first impulse isn't necessarily fear or your, you know, your, where you wind up isn't necessarily fear, even if you were fearful at first. Um, but I, it, it, it's geopolitically, I have no idea where that's going to come from. Um, but it's interesting that where it does exist, where we can sense that tendency towards adapt adaptability, we're finding each other. Um, and not that we're all perfectly adaptable and perfect in that, but there's an international, there's a kind of a, a global network that is able to find itself um, so maybe it, it'll transcend geopolitical boundaries in a way and become more of a meme or more of a, a culture 
that that can have influence in different places? I don't know, but it's an interesting question. Right. And and here in the United States, we're culturally not used to looking to other people or other cultures for answers. And so that's part of how we need to be more adaptable here is to put aside our own pride in our own conceit, you know, and, 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 and be able to, to learn these lessons and hear these messages from other places, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's to our own peril if we don't. We have a long way to go to, to, to achieve that level of humility, but it's, it sort of has to happen if we're going to make it. <laughs> so hopefully it'll be a, It'll be a survival impulse at some point, like evolve or die in a way. Right. Well, and there are thresholds too. I mean, I'm sure that you know you've maybe, you know, maybe you've planted a, a, a you know a tree or a, a perennial before, and you've put a big ring of soil around it, built up a big ring of soil around it, right? And then maybe you'd like put your hose in there or wherever to fill it up, and the water goes up, water goes up, water goes up, you know, and when it gets to the top, you know, you need to take that hose away because you don't want it to start leaking over the top. But if you let it sit in there, what happens is that there's a little trickle over the top that because of the force of the water quickly becomes a large breach and then your whole ring can get washed away. I'm sure you've seen that happen before. It, there's that point of overflow that could happen and it happens in a second, even though it's been building, 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 boom, there it is. Yeah. And it can, it can take you um, by surprise which this did, obviously, even though in some, for some people it wasn't a surprise what's, what's happening. It was predicted and as inevitable. Um, but I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I think this has been a great conversation today. We've gone a little over an hour, and that's about how long I, I like to go with these for listeners. So maybe you could tell our listeners how to find more about you online and, and what you're doing. And I know that you uh, have... Um, that there's things that you sell from your farm too to raise money for the sanctuary and all that. So just telling people how they can find all that would be great. Oh, thanks. Yeah, our we have a farm website and we started it last year. Um, CBD products that are that that are grown and we even grow the seed here. We combine it with uh, some of our perennial crops like sea berry and autumn olive to and pine to uh, enhance just to create a, an all on farm synergistic beneficial oil. And, um, and then we have various tinctures and miso and it's going to be growing by leaps and bounds this season because we're consciously now adding things all the time. So examples from a perennial wild ecosystem that all the proceeds go to, um, conserving the property, conserving the land, and supporting the sanctuary. And that's show farm, SHO farm dash CB duck. That's we named our CBD branch, CB duck. Show farm dash CB duck dot com. And then um, our sanctuary is sanctuary at show, SHO dot org. And then the foundation, the nonprofit foundation that owns the property is called living future foundation it's livingfuture.org great thank you so much for joining me today melissa i really appreciate it and um, i hope that we can have another conversation some other time a complete pleasure and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and i look forward to talking more in the future Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. 
May you find joy in your own nature and peace.